Hello. In this series of reflections, I'm going to be drawing on ideas I developed in a recent book called A Living Gospel, Reading God's Story in Holy Lives. This book came to me after many years writing about saints and holy people in a number of books. I always felt that we had much to learn from the stories of the saints, to see them as actual human beings whose holiness was not some abstract quality that they came to embody, but something that was expressed in the whole course of their lives. This holiness was not just signified in moments of mystical insight or heroic charity or martyrdom, but in the whole journey of their lives, in the search and discovery of their vocation, in their ongoing efforts to go deeper into that calling, their faithfulness and persistence even in the face of obstacles, even in the face of doubts and suffering, even in contention with their own weakness and failings. I was interested in the gospel story that was written in their lives, not just so we could better understand them, and not just so we could better understand the gospel, but so that we could better understand the ways that that gospel story is also written in our own lives, those of us who call ourselves followers of Christ, even though we probably feel that we are very far from becoming saints. I'm going to start by expanding more on this theme, then in subsequent sessions I will reflect on how it applies to three contemporary Christians, Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, whom I was fortunate to know and work with in the last years of her life, Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk, and finally Henry Nowen, my friend and author of many years, who is well known to many of you and whose society is sponsoring this retreat, and finally some conclusions bringing us back to our own lives. But I'd like to begin by sharing with you a reflection written by a young Argentinian priest named Jorge Bergoglio, whom you better know as Pope Francis, at the time of his ordination in 1969. Perhaps you'll recognize the familiar voice of the Pope in this personal creed which he wrote as a young man just setting out on his ministry. He wrote, I want to believe in God the Father, who loves me like a child, and in Jesus the Lord, who infused my life with his spirit to make me smile and so carry me to the eternal kingdom of life. I believe in the church. I believe in my life story, which was pierced by God's loving gaze, who on that spring day of September 21st came out to meet me and invite me to follow him. I believe in my pain, made fruitless by the egotism in which I take refuge. I believe in the goodness of others, and that I must love them without fear and without betraying them, never seeking my own security. I believe in the religious life. I believe I wish to love a lot. I believe in the burning death of each day from which I flee, but which smiles at me, inviting me to accept her. I believe in God's patience, as good and welcoming as a summer's night. I believe that Dad is with the Lord in heaven. I believe in Mary, my mother, who loves me and will never leave me alone. And I believe in the surprise of each day, in which will be manifest love, strength, betrayal, and sin, which will always be with me until that definitive encounter with that marvelous face which I do not know, which always escapes me, but which I wish to know and love. Amen. I find this a fascinating and very moving document, quite apart from the light it shines on the future Pope. Among other things, it reveals the strong imprint of his Jesuit formation. You may know that the formation of Jesuits is based on the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius, and one of the principal themes of the exercises is what he calls discernment, which is a way of paying attention to how God speaks to us in the events of our daily lives, in the movements of our hearts, in what provides us with feelings of what he calls consolation or desolation, especially as that relates to our vocation, the distinctive way, as he puts it, that we are all created to praise God in our way of living. The word creed comes from the Latin words for I believe. The official creed, which we recite in church, is a list of doctrines and articles of faith, But as we see in Bergoglio's creed, he's not just offering a recital of doctrines. He's pronouncing an affirmation 
of God's presence in his life. This involves memory with specific reference to a critical turning point. So he writes, I believe in my life story, which was pierced by God's loving gaze, who on that spring day of September 21st came out to meet me, to invite me to follow him. He's referring here to the day when he was 16 and he happened to walk into a church in Buenos Aires, and he was moved to make his confession. Afterward, he had the burning conviction that he would become a priest. But while looking back, he also looks toward the future, the promise of his encounter one day with what he calls the marvelous face of God. And in between, there is the present moment, the surprise of each day, in which he contends with the struggle between his own weakness, his egotism, his stinginess of soul, and his desire, as he puts it, to love a lot. It reveals a lot about Pope Francis, but his text also invites us to consider how we might compose our own creed, interweaving the articles of faith with an understanding of our own lives and our personal mission. In the case of Pope Francis, that sense of mission is rooted in a deep apprehension of God's presence in his own life. I believe in my life story. His life story is part of his creed, along with God, Jesus, Mary, the Church, his religious life as a Jesuit. It's a story marked by particular events and relationships, specific joys and sorrows, while it continues to be written in the surprise of every day. What would that mean for us to say, I believe in my life story? Could we also imagine the ways that God is speaking to us, and perhaps to others, in ways we can't know, precisely because of our story? For Christians, it it comes as no surprise to consider that God speaks to us through stories. The claims of Christianity are based on a particular story, the story of Jesus, as recounted in the Gospels. And we would say that it's a story. That means it has a narrative structure. It's not just a collection of Jesus' sayings. The message of Jesus' story is not just revealed on the first page, the story of his nativity, or on the last page, the chapter after his resurrection, or in his parting words. It emerges through the whole story. And that story is not just an account of glorias or mysteries, great miracles. It's also a story of conflict, rejection, betrayal, ultimately passion. And if we ask, where's God in that story? The answer is clearly, God is in the whole story, the wonderful moments, but also the misunderstandings, uh, the occasions for exasperation, the experience of rejection, apparent failure. When we look at the gospel in this way, it invites us to look at our own story with fresh eyes, to see the patterns of grace and mystery that run through our lives, not just in the moments when we felt closest to God, but even in the times the thought of God was very far away, not just in the awesome days, like the time that Jesus turned water into wine, that was a great day, but in the times of doubt, exasperation, loss. I don't know whether Pope Francis is familiar with another Jesuit, Jean-Pierre de Cossade, who lived in the 18th century, but I think he would resonate with with his words. The Holy Spirit writes no more Gospels except in our hearts. All we do from moment to moment is live this new Gospel of the Holy Spirit. We, if we are holy, are the paper. Our sufferings and our actions are the ink. The workings of the Holy Spirit are his pen. And with it, he writes a living gospel. That's the quotation that inspired the title of my book, but it's really inspired my work over many years in thinking and writing about saints and holy people and what they have to teach us. Among other things, I think they teach us that the path to holiness is not straightforward. It's not just marked by a a tally of achievements or mystical insights to be checked off a list. It's a lifelong journey in which we strive, mostly by small steps, to grow in faith, hope, and love. And like every journey, it's marked by twists and turns, setbacks and doldrums. Like us, the saints were people of flesh and blood struggling to find their way, not knowing exactly where their path would take them. 
And I think we can learn a lot by shifting our attention from their teachings, their mighty achievements, to what de Cossade called the living gospel written in their hearts. My hope is that through reflection on such witnesses, we may learn to read our own story in the same way. The great St. Augustine was the first Christian writer to look at his life in this way as a kind of spiritual text that told a story about God. In his work, The Confessions, a book written in Middle Age, he looked back over his life in light of the critical turning point, his conversion to the Catholic faith. From that vantage point, he was able to discern the presence of God in his own life story, even when the thought of God was farthest from him, even in moments of confusion and sadness. As a young man, he had sought happiness in friendship, love, pleasure, status, and learning. But his life was continuously shadowed by sadness and suffering, both his own and the suffering he caused to others. Something was missing. And yet as he came to believe, he was never truly alone. For all the while, he wrote, far above, your mercy hovered faithfully over me. His memoir is a reflection on the living gospel written in his own life and an invitation to others to read their own lives in that same light. I mentioned that his spiritual memoir was written from the perspective of his conversion to the Catholic faith, and the same is true for Dorothy Day in her memoir, The Long Loneliness, and Thomas Merton in his famous memoir, The Seven Story Mountain. But as we shall see, their choice to become Catholics was not the end of their story. It was just another step on the path of an ongoing journey. Conversion, it turns out, is not a once-and-for-all event, but an ongoing process of turning toward God. And often when we think we're finished or that we've reached the end, it's a sign that we've got lost along the way. Our friend Henry Nouwen often said that to be a Christian is precisely a matter of learning to see and understand our own story in relation to the story of Jesus. This is not just a matter of measuring our actions against a checklist of his teachings, but according to the pattern of his life. And what does that mean? It certainly doesn't mean the pattern of his life as a carpenter in Nazareth or as an itinerant preacher and miracle worker in Palestine. It means a life in which our own struggles and sufferings, our efforts to be more loving, more open, more self-giving, find their meaning in his life. That's what it means to walk the path of holiness, which St. Paul described as putting off the old person and putting on Christ. In the lives of the saints, we see continuously replayed a process by which a person's life story is conformed to or, or grafted into the wider pattern of God's story in Jesus. This happens in countless forms, in greatly different, different circumstances, and with allowance for vastly different human material. Among all the saints in history, Francis of Assisi is probably the most influential and beloved. His message is not easily reduced to a set of Franciscan teachings. Instead, his influence and legacy are rooted more in the example of a way of living, an effort to follow Jesus by imitating his way of life in the form of detachment from worldly values and notions of success in a spirit of poverty and service and solidarity with the poor and marginalized, and in joyous love for God and all God's creation. His message was shared not so much through his limited writings as through the early biographies and legends that circulated about his life, and they show that even in the case of a great saint like Francis, his journey was a story of becoming. A story of becoming Francis, a story marked by doubts and uncertainty, Yet once he determined to follow where God was calling, he took one step, and then another, and another still. According to the ancient legends, the conversion of Francis occurred over a series of episodes. Starting out as the son of a wealthy cloth merchant in Assisi, Francis was a carefree reveler who liked to entertain his friends with songs and poetry. After taking part in a pointless war with a neighboring city-state, he was taken captive and later, following his release, he suffered a terrible illness. This experience upended his comfortable existence and started him questioning many of his old assumptions about life. One day, as he was wandering the outskirts of the city, 
he encountered a poor leper on the road. After dismounting from his horse, he offered the poor man a few coins. But then, moved by some divine impulse, he leaned forward to kiss the leper's ravaged hands. Francis had always been a fastidious person, with an abhorrence of squalor and illness and ugliness. But in this gesture he was seemingly liberated from a whole identity based on status, security, and worldly success. His life began to take shape around an utterly new agenda, contrary to the values of his family and his world. The next step came when his angry father brought him before the bishop and accused him of stealing from his warehouse to give alms to the poor. Francis acknowledged his fault, stripped off his clothes, and embraced a new life of voluntary poverty. Eventually there came a moment when he was praying before a crucifix in the dilapidated chapel of San Damiano, and I heard a voice speak to him, Francis, repair my church which has fallen into disappointment disrepair, as you can see. At first he was inclined to take this assignment, literally, so he, he set about physically restoring the ruined building. Only later did he understand his mission in a wider, more spiritual sense. His vocation was to repair the church by discarding centuries of pomp and power and recalling the radical simplicity of the gospel, the spirit of poverty, and the image of Christ in the poor. Francis had been on a journey that prepared him to hear that voice. It came to him not only from the image of Christ on the cross, but from the impulses of his own heart, through the circumstances of his encounters with his neighbors. And Francis responded to the voice that came from his own experiences of suffering. Even then it took him a while to figure out what this voice was calling him to do. But in Francis we see this grafting of one person's biography into the story of Jesus, so that his own life story becomes a living gospel, which in turn becomes a reference point for others on their spiritual path. Mother Teresa of Calcutta shared her story of how, as an Albanian nun, she spent 20 years of her life teaching in one of her order's schools in India. Then one day, while traveling on a train to Darjeeling, she received an unmistakable call from God to be poor with the poor and to love God in the most distressing disguise of the poorest of the poor. With her congregation's permission, she left her convent, replaced her habit with a simple white sari, and she went out to encounter Jesus in the desperate byways of Calcutta. It was the beginning of what became the Missionaries of Charity, an international order rooted in Mother Teresa's ministry among the dying, but also, in effect, rooted in that call within a call that she'd experienced that day on a train ride in the Himalayas. Her story became paradigmatic for her followers, showing, in her case, that vocation, like conversion, is not a once-in-a-lifetime event, but requires a willingness to keep listening, to keep responding to the voice that calls us to go farther, deeper, Many other saints, including St. Teresa of Avila, St. Ignatius of Loyola, or St. Therese of Lisieux, following the example of St. Augustine, believed in their life stories and shared them with the world. I've mentioned the examples of Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton. In both cases, they told a story marked by joy and love, by fortuitous encounters with books and friends, by intuitions of transcendence but also by sorrow and loss and long stretches when the thought of God was far away. Ultimately, they came to see it all as a story of grace. God was present in the whole story, both in the lonely wandering in the desert and in the experiences of discovery and homecoming. And then there's Henry Nouwen, who didn't write a formal autobiography, but whose spiritual writings, as you know, were frequently expressed through diaries and frankly personal reflections, including the Genesee diary about his sabbatical in a Trappist monastery, Gracias about his year in the missions in Latin America, The Road to Daybreak, Behold the Mirror about his experience of near death, Adam about his experiences at L'Arche Daybreak, including an account of his emotional breakdown and healing, or his posthumous sabbatical journey. He didn't write these books to present himself as an ideal model or someone to be imitated, 
but to try to share the story of God that was written in his own journey, his own story, notwithstanding his own complex personality with all his evident gifts and obvious wounds. I'll be talking more about Dorothy Day, but I want to recall just one story that's always struck me because it shows the potential significance of very small incidents in our life and how they can open a window on a much wider horizon. This occurred when Dorothy was a child living in Chicago, and she went searching one day for her friend Catherine Barrett, who lived in a neighboring tenement apartment. She burst into Catherine's apartment, and she startled to come upon her friend's mother, Mrs. Barrett, who was on her knees, saying her prayers. Mrs. Barrett calmly informed Dorothy that Catherine was out and then carried on with her prayers. And Dorothy wrote, I felt a warm burst of love toward Mrs. Barrett that I've never forgotten. A feeling of gratitude and happiness that still warms my heart when I remember her. She had God, and there was beauty and joy in her life. That memory, remarkably, remained with Dorothy Day, even over the course of a life marked by unusual drama, even as she says, as she, quote, groaned at the hideous sordidness of man's life. Still, there were moments when, in the midst of misery and class strife, life was shot through with glory. Mrs. Barrett, in her sordid little tenement flat, finished her breakfast dishes at 10 o'clock in the morning and got down on her knees and prayed to God. I'd like to pause for a moment to consider that behind every great saint there must be many anonymous witnesses like Mrs. Barrett who had no idea of the impact of their simple practice of the faith. And I think in our own lives we could find other memories like that when we caught a glimpse of some ultimate dimension, a deeper reality than the surface of everyday life, which connected us with a higher truth and purpose. Do we remember those moments? Do we forget them? Or did they plant seeds in our hearts that continue to bear fruit? Do we need to nourish those seeds, to think back like Pope Francis on the events in our own life story that have brought us to this point and that point us in the direction of our final end? It also makes us think about how often chance encounters and events have presented us with signs and answers that we could not appreciate or receive because we weren't paying attention or we were not asking the right questions. I sometimes think of Jesus' seeming record of success in calling his disciples. Drop your nets, he seemed to say, and before you know it, ordinary fishermen are just doing just that and following him without question. Yet Andrew and Simon were surely not the only fishermen Jesus encountered on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Perhaps, as Jesus discerned, they were the ones predisposed for such a summons, already yearning for a task and a mission greater than casting their nets into the sea. In other cases, the disciples made their searching plain. Jesus noticed some of John's disciples tagging after him, and he stopped and asked them, What are you seeking? Of course, they were seeking the deepest meaning of life. They hardly knew how to put it into words, though they sensed that this mysterious stranger somehow held the key to the answers. In their awkwardness, they gave just about the lamest possible reply. Uh, where are you staying? To this Jesus simply replied, Come and see, which they did. Here's someone who knows the deepest questions of our hearts, who knows what we're seeking, who knows that the only answer comes from seeing for ourselves. What is it like to live in his presence, to tag along after him and observe his ways, to find where he is staying with the hope that we might stay with him forever. We don't have to be alive 2,000 years ago to respond to that invitation, to come and see. Many are called, but few are chosen. Perhaps only those are chosen who are already on a quest for answers, who are ready to respond when the call comes, whether that call comes from a mysterious stranger on the beach or the needs of our neighbor or the demands of history, or from the crucifix in a dilapidated church, or while riding on a train in the Himalayas, or with the impulse to enter a confessional in a church in Buenos Aires, or from a harried mother and housewife kneeling in her kitchen to say her prayers. 
In telling the stories of saints and holy people, it can sometimes seem that they are no more than a catalog of pious attitudes and heroic achievements. But the more interesting accounts enable us to read the story of God that is written in their lives. That living gospel is reflected not just in their accomplishments, but in their search, their questions, their determination to be awake and alive and prepared to respond to the divine voice that speaks to their hearts, inviting them to find the meaning of their story in relation to the story that God is telling us through Jesus, the one, as the Pope says, who infused my life with his spirit to make me smile and so to carry me to the eternal life of the kingdom. And if we ask, where's God in the story? The answer is that God is present in the whole story. And whether we realize it or not, the same is true for ourselves. Thank you.